start, my name's uh, Rob Muscat, I'm the President of the Society uh, and I'll be presenting uh, a lecture this afternoon specifically on Operation Cobra which happened uh, mid-late July 1944. So it's not on the landings as such, uh, it's, uh, uh, sometime after the uh, June 6 D-Day landings. But before I begin, a bit of um, a few ads I'd like to mention. Uh, the first one being, as you're probably aware, uh, the movie Long Tan will be coming out, uh, uh, out on the 8th of August. Yeah. We're thinking that uh, if people are interested, that we might just uh, have a bit of a social occasion where we can meet up here at George Street Cinemas on the 10th of August, um, probably around 11 o'clock, um, and just see the movie together, um, if you like, and then maybe have a bit of a bit of a feed afterwards, or a feed before. We'll see how we go. So uh, look out for an email this week uh, with some more details if you're interested. It's really just a bit of a get together. That's all. So there's no lectures or anything. Just we thought you know it'd be nice to get together as a group. See a movie together, have a, uh, a bit of bot to eat, a few drinks, and then uh, we we'll go on our merry way. Uh, so that's uh, so that time uh, in mid August. Um, if you've got any old books, any military history books that you might want to uh, donate to the society, because as you can see, we like to put a raffle on. Um, it is probably the uh, the only income we actually get apart from membership fees um, and it just helps the society um, you know paying their costs uh, so if you've got if you're looking at your library at home and you think oh, you know what I've read that a couple of times now I wouldn't mind donating it if you could just bring it along every month uh, we're quite happy to take it off your hands uh, each month and it just means that we can keep our raffle going I really, we really appreciate that uh, we've got a couple of excursions coming up. We are trying to, well not trying to, we will plan an excursion to uh, the Infantry Museum up at Singo, Singleton. Um, when I went there in the, in the late 90s, it was a lot smaller, but I, from my understanding, they've expanded it. Um, so we, I'll be the bus driver again. I'll have the bus ready. We'll leave from here, from the city. We're looking as a possible date, uh, or sorry, I'll give you the month because we've got a date but we just need to check it out. It will be late September and it will be a Sunday. Mm. Okay, so we'll probably leave here about eight o'clock, get up there about 10-ish. Um, we'll probably take about an hour and a half up there. They've had, they have enlarged in the, the, concert, mm. uh, the, uh, the rooms. Um, it looks pretty good. What they've done is fantastic. And then have lunch and we'll be back here about what, three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. Uh, and then, Dennis, you want to just quickly explain the excursion down to Albion Park? Oh, okay, the uh, one for the Signal Fleet um, Museum last Saturday, I met up with an old mate of mine who's a Woe One. Um, John had know him, um, Warren, uh, who's secretary of the uh, Reserve Association, yeah, Warren Barnes. And he's uh, retired now and he's going to be a special guide on that day because yeah. he was an infantry instructor. Yeah, um, yeah Hards, uh, down at Albion Park Rail on a Sunday, you know, we can get a you know, special uh, fare, uh, even if you're not a pensioner. You know, there's a family fare now, you know, although Seamus tells me it's gone up to 275. <laughs> 270, 270. Us old still get it for 250. <laughs> um, but down to Albion Park, I'll, I'll set up a, um, a time schedule and uh, I'll probably meet you there. Uh, I'm a volunteer at Haas. We've got a fabulous collection of aircraft. Uh, F-111s, we've got a Connie that actually flies, an XC-121C, uh, ex-US Air Force. Um, we have... Uh, a Mustang at the moment, we've got uh, Vampires, Sea Venom under construction, Tracker, um, C-47, three uh, various uh, DC-3 C-47s. Um, we've just taken over the, the running of the Naval Historic Flight. Um, you know, this is my service <coughs> and I've got a shit on it. 
uh, pardon me, <laughs> um, to our lady here. But, um, you know, some idiot 30 years ago, we had a flyable sea venom, wonderful aircraft, the last of the Navy, you know, twin tailors, and uh, it was flying, and somebody at Albatross decided that they'd pull it apart and put it in boxes for, you know, the future. The only problem is no idiot looked at it for 30 years. The roof on the two boxes uh, rusted and everything was floating. So the aircraft will never, never fly again. You know, everything's corroded in there. You know, the, the old aluminium, um, I call it uh, talcum powder. Uh, but we're putting together the sea venom. Um, I can honestly say one day I was a guide for the aircraft and the next day I was an engineer putting on the port <laughs> wing um, with a lot of persuasion. Um, but it's good fun. Um, it's a good fun. It's a great day. Got a, got a, a um, calf down there. It's $20 entrance. There's the 747. Um, there's the uh, PBY or Consolidated Catalina. Um, so forth, so on. And we've also got a um, P3C Orion, which the Air Force very kindly donated, um, mm -hmm. flew it in one day and said, we'll be back next week um, just to take out the secrets, which they did. And uh, lo and behold, out of the blue, the Chief of Defence um, willed it to us, no cost, with full tanks of fuel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all these aircraft are either <coughs> flying or, or static. Um, those that are flying, we've got to be a little bit extra careful on. Um, we old fellas, you know, so we don't fall out the hatch. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's both a flying museum and a heritage museum. We also have now a uh, adjunct to this at Parks, and we have quite a number of aircraft up there. Um, another aircraft we've got down there is a West, uh, Whistling Wessex, which used to be my taxi. We've just inherited two Iroquois. Uh, from the Navy, and uh, we haven't got delivery of those yet. Um, but these are aircraft that we're going to refurbish uh, and hold as a um, actual uh, unit within HARS. And I'm not sure, but um, you know, I'm sure uh, we'll do a better job than the Navy budget allows and their willpower allows. Uh, and maybe we'll just keep hold of them. But there is a deed of agreement, which uh, is quite futuristic, and we're also going to help them refurbish a lot of the aircraft that they've got down there that should be on display. So, so it'll be so, a great day. Yeah, so Albion Park, we're going to about November. Yeah. So it'll be uh, early to mid-November. So and then we'll get those dates out to you, and um, just look out for them. So there's those two excursions coming up, and also the movie. So keep an eye out for those uh, emails as they come through. It'd be great to, for you guys to come along. All right, so we'll go straight into the lecture today. Uh, as it's titled, it's Breakout from Normandy. As I said earlier, it's not really about the landings as such, even though I'll put it in the context. Uh, but it's the, the, the days after the landings um, and then um, the breakout itself is from the Normandy region into uh, Brittany. So it's what it's the actual breakout. Well, some, in some cases, uh, depending on who you read, they call it breakthrough and then breakout. But I'll come to that in the lecture. So just to give a context, uh, we know about the landings itself uh, on the 6th of June. Um, Approximately 156,000 men, 5,000 ships. Uh, we had first US Army, which were tasked to take uh, Utah and then Omaha beaches. Utah, in the end, proved a lot easier to take and they were able to move inland further than they did with Omaha. Omaha proved to be a lot more <coughs> difficult. Uh, British Second Army, on the other side, uh, the British had gold and sword, and the Canadians in the middle had Juno. Now, <coughs> according to who you read, uh, none of the objectives were taken on that first day. Some authors would say that the 101st Screaming Eagles, 101st <laughs> Airborne Division, did take their objective. Uh, but whether that was one of the main objectives, it really depended on which historian you read. 
but there's some consensus that no major objective was taken on the first day. Uh, when we look at the, the Germans, on the other hand, uh, as to why they allowed the Allies to take the beaches in the first place, it came down to two particular uh, flaws in their strategy. One was the, the loss of movement and communication, that is troop movements, so reinforcements. <coughs> and the second <coughs> was this over elaborate command structure. So as you know that um, if you look at the structure of uh, the command of the German defences, you had your divisional commanders, you then had corps commanders, <coughs> then you had Rommel and Rundstedt, which were both of your uh, major commanders at, uh, of the <coughs> Western Theatre. But they couldn't make a decision because they had to go all the way up to Hitler. So, so in order for any local decision to be made, it had to go through a number of levels. And you can imagine if you have an Allied force pushing forward onto your positions, you need to make some quick decisions and that was impossible to, to, to be done. And that, and that, that particular last point, sorry, that, uh, those particular flaws in the German defences was the cause probably of why uh, we got to Cobra and why it happened. But I'll talk more about that later. So that's there the landings. This is, you're probably familiar with some of the, the diagrams themselves. You can see that uh, the Americans were, did not um, um, take, uh, didn't, in, didn't push too far f uh, inland at Omaha. Omaha being this particular beach in the middle. But you can see they made some significant gains uh, at Utah with the 4th fourth, fourth Infantry Division. The 4th Infantry Division uh, was later to meet up with the two airborne divisions, the 82nd and 101st. Um, and then the Canadians were a lot more successful in Ju uh, at Juno, as were the British at Gold. But what you can see, at the end of June, the 6th, on that day, you would see that each beach were still isolated from each other. That was a major concern for both Montgomery, who was a ground force commander, and Eisenhower. So by the end of the day, no objective was taken, and they were, the, beach, the beaches were still isolated. So the fear was that if they didn't consolidate the beachhead quickly, uh, they would be outflanked by the Germans, who were beginning to send reinforcements from the north and from the interior. It would take some time, but there was still that, that concern that the beachhead would be lost. So I'll just go back quickly about the German strategy. <coughs> uh, there was a difference of opinion between Rundstedt and Rommel. Uh, what Runstead believed was that he was, a, he was still an advocate of the German defence doctrine of a strong interior. Rommel, from his experience in Northern Africa, had a different opinion. What he wanted to do is concentra concentrate the defences on the beaches and not allow the Allies to push inland. And he based that specifically knowing that they would not have air superiority. So in my reading of this was that Rommel was very much aware of German weaknesses and was able to articulate them and therefore change strategy. Where Runstead uh, stuck to the, uh, the, the German doctrine of the time and was not flexible in his thinking. In the end, 
They took it to Hitler, who did not make a decision. But the fact that there was no decision made as to which avenue to take to stop our lives, it caused greater confusion on the ground. The first major consolidation of the beachhead happened with the taking of Karatan by the 101st Airborne Division. Now it's very significant. Karatan was a gateway to the Cotentin Peninsula, in particular the port of Cherbourg. <coughs> So the taking of Karatan opened the way for that beach head to, uh, to be consolidated and it also meant that Cherbourg would eventually be a secondary objective to be taken. Now a few days after the landings, a three-day a three storm hit the, the landings itself and it lost all the, the port facilities in that area. With the port facilities went all the logistics. So the Allies lost a large number of uh, fuel, armour and armaments. So Eisenhower, Bradley, Montgomery desperately needed to capture Sherbourg in order to refuel and support the advancement inland. So the taking of Karatan was extremely important. <coughs> While that was going on, on the other side, in the British sector, uh, you had Operation Epsom. Now Operation Epsom was Montgomery's brainchild and he was tasked by Eisenhower to push forward. They needed to get, and needed to take Khan. Khan was a significant objective. It was the objective on the first day and they failed to achieve that objective. Eisenhower made it very clear to Montgomery that that needed to be taken as quickly as possible. However, <coughs> the Germans, Rommel in particular, believed that Khan was the only objective of the Allied invasion. So in doing that, he ensured that all his strength, his panzer divisions, would be located surrounding Khan and protecting that, that city and that hub. Uh, the British at the, the British, uh, sorry, the battle at the village blockage uh, was quite significant. It was a German victory, and what you see there in the picture are tigers, tiger tank. There weren't many tigers, but in this particular battle, they were extensively used. Um, General Whit Whitman was the uh, Panzer Divisional Leader at the time. Um, and he made a bit of a mess to the British, the British infantry that were taking that area. And it really stopped the British at its, in its tracks. The thinking here was, and you can see that the, uh, the particular Panzer divisions that were around Khan were one of the strongest in the German army at that time, on the Western Front anyway. The 21st, the 12th SS, the Panzer Lee. Uh, as I said, there were some Tigers, mostly Panthers, Panther tanks in those uh, Panzer divisions. But the thinking here in that last point was that Khan being difficult to take uh, this was not the original thinking at the time. The original thinking was that Khan would be taken by the British and they would push through to eventually liberate Paris. That had to change. 
allies had to be flexible. Realising that Khan would not be taken as quickly as they thought, it was then decided that Montgomery, with the British Second Army under the command of Lieutenant General Dempsey, will pivot around Khan with the view of taking it. But while the British were concentrating their efforts to take Khan and its surrounding districts, the Americans would swing around from the right, take the Coteton Peninsula up to Sherbourg, down the peninsula, and eventually split, take Brittany, and then swing around from the south and eventually move forward towards Paris. Okay, but that had to be that had to change, that had to be developed once the landings had been uh, completed and once the Allies realised that Khan would not be taken as easily as they thought. The other issue that they had was the terrain. We've got to remember too that the, the Battle of Normandy was probably the first time the Americans were ever tested on the battlefield. Um, Tunisia was difficult. It was their first real test of battle. And initially they failed dismally. And later in the campaign, they succeeded. Sicily was a bit of a push through, it was a walk through. But by the time they hit Europe, they were, they were up against some fairly formidable forces. The Germans weren't as weak as we might assume. A lot of those Panzer divisions were, uh, still had a number of combat veterans from the Eastern Front. So they were still needed, they were still developing as an army. They were still developing as a fighting force. In fact, the 90th Infantry Division uh, was uh, was regarded as a as as a uh, as a very weak and green division. In fact, Bradley had to dismiss two divisional commanders until he found somebody who was worthy of leading that division. So most of those American soldiers fighting after the D Day during this time, late June, early July still had to develop themselves as soldiers and as a fighting unit. So not only were they up against a formidable fighting force of the Germans, Panzer divisions, but they also had to deal with some very difficult fighting terrain. And the blockage was that terrain. What you see in that picture, you see a number of hedge, hedgerows which uh, were found right across this whole region. And what you notice is a number of tanks going through the hedgerows. The hedgerows were just that, they were hedges, but they're not the hedges that we see in our backyards here in Australia, on our front yards. We're talking about <coughs> up to three to four metres high, in some cases two to three metres wide, um, and founded on one to two metre high mounds of dirt. And I'll show you some photos of some typical hedgerows that the American soldiers had to face. Now, cutting through that was immensely difficult. In the early stages of the war, the Americans, as did the Germans, tended to use the normal arteries, the road network. But they also were succumbed to a number of ambushes. It was only later on that they started to um, become a little bit innovative and find ways through the hedgerows. Okay, and as I said there, after a three day storm, uh, the need to capture Sherbourg was immensely, uh, was en enormously um, on the agenda. 
The Major Collins, sorry, Major General Collins, Seventh Corps, was tasked to take Cherbourg, which he did. There was a tough fight, uh, but they did it. Were able to capture thirty thousand <coughs> prisoners of war, including the commanding general there, Schlieben. Once Cherbourg was taken, it meant that logistics could be then uh, redirected and were able to supply the uh, American forces. Now, I'll just go forward a bit. Okay, this will give you an idea of how the Germans were able to stop the Allied or the American, the First Army advance. The thinking was that once, once Sherberg was taken, it would be a quick move down the Cotentin Peninsula and quickly get to the bottom of Normandy, which allowed them open rain and open country. But they had to get through this bockage, these hedgerows. Now the Germans, knowing that the Allies would be moving south, used the hedgerows to their advantage. And you can see in this diagram how they're able to develop a, a very intricate defensive position. So at each corner of the hedgerows, they would either have 88 millimeter guns or machine gun um, units positioned to fire inside the square. They also had booby traps, mines, and so forth within the square itself. So as the Americans come th came through each squared hedgerow, they were, they were up against some formidable defences. And this caused a large number of casualties. And it slowed the pace down immensely. What, it, what, what happened was eventually the ground force commanders of each battalion and each regiment and each division of the American US First Army started to become very creative. They needed to move quickly, they were tasked to move quickly. They couldn't, they couldn't then continue on with the same tactics. Uh, so they started to become very creative and they virtually rewrote the US field manual in order to, to get through the blockage. Okay, this is just one quote from an American officer. What they found was that uh, battle fatigue in the US First Army was extremely high. Uh, a lot of men were being pulled out of the units, suffering from chronic battle fatigue. Uh, the stress levels was enormously high um, and as you can see this next picture, it just gives you an idea of um, what the men had to, what the infantry had to deal with with, the, with, uh, with this particular terrain. Uh, probably the most uh, significant level of triggers of stress was not knowing what's on the other side of the hedgerows. They couldn't see through it. You never knew where the enemy was. So, uh, according to US figures, the US First Army had the highest level of stress um, in any theatre of war and in any period of war uh, uh, in, during this time. So, one innovation was the Rhino. So, you can imagine if you have an armoured brigade pushing through the hedge groves. The, the problem was that as the Sherman tank or the Stuart tank entered into the hedge grove, the, the hedge row was so thick that it meant that the tank would have to expose its vulnerable underbelly to the German guns. And as we know, once that happens, they were knocked out of action. 
Now this happened on a number of occasions. They tried making, uh, tried using explosives to blow a hole into the hedge grove to allow for the tanks to come through. But that, uh, that only just um, gave the alarm to the Germans and they knew they were coming. So one particular afternoon, uh, there was a lot of uh, NCOs and, and uh, talking about how they could deal with the problem. And one particular sergeant by the name of Curtis Cullum, from the 2nd Armoured Recon Regiment, came up with the idea of attaching steel teeth to the front of a Sherman. And this is what it looked like. The steel was actually taken from uh, the German um, defences at the, on the beaches. So they just cut, they cut the steel, welded them onto the front of a Sherman. Now, doing this meant that at high speed, a tank was able to push through and cut through the hedge graves. It also meant that the Germans were taken by surprise. Now, as well as this innovation, the armoured regiments and the infantry regiments started to work closer together. So this is the first time in American history, military history, where you have infantry and armour working side by side. So you don't just have a tank or a brigade of tanks pushing through hedge groves, but you had infantry attached to the tanks, either riding on top or walking beside, to exploit the break. So I'll just give you an idea here of what the opening looked like. And you can see infantry soldiers making their way into the open paddock on the other side. All right, and then you see here some sketches of how this new tactical formation was created. So what you see on this side here, okay, you have a support tank and mortar provides pressure fire as infantry moves through the hedgerow, engineers then uh, make a demolition. So here we still have the demolition, the opening, tanks coming through, infantry and support fire. Here we have the tanks coming through, giving support fire as the infantry move into the hedgerow itself, the paddock itself. Now what this allowed then was to the pace of the advancement uh, increase exponentially. So the US First Army was able to move quicker through the blockage and to achieve its targets. Okay, that's the taking of Sherbourg, just to give you an idea of the poor facilities at Sherbourg. Now all this was happening in June. From the 6th of June to the 30th of June. So the US First Army was making its way up to Sherbourg and then taking Sherbourg and then moving down the Cotterton Peninsula. Okay, July, it started, things started to change by July. Hitler replaced Rundstedt with von Klug, who eventually became commander of West, OB West and Army Group B. Rommel, you remember, on the 17th of July was strafed while he was in a car. Um, straight by Allied aircraft, he was injured significantly and he had to be sent back to Germany and, and didn't return. Okay, um, Rundstedt, interesting, I, I read as to why, what triggered his uh, removal. Um, by the late June, he gave Keitel a ring and uh, with, with, with a few expletives, um, yelled down the, the phone and said, um, we need to we need to seek peace. So 
So at this stage, Ranstead decided that you know, the war was over. And this was uh, late June. Um, as a result of that phone call, he was removed immediately by Hitler. Uh, Panzer Group West was also, uh, also uh, was able to get a new commander, Eva Bach, and 7th Army, uh, and also got a new commander, General Halser. Now, while 7th Army was located um, in Normandy, 15th Army was still waiting, sitting there, waiting for the Allies to arrive at Calais. Now at this point, um, Rommel, Rundstedt uh, were pleading for Hitler to move Panzer divisions from the 15th to the 7th. Uh, he refused. So while all this was going on in June, the 15th Army was still there sitting on there and twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the real Allied landing. Uh, Bradley's 1st Army had four corps, 13 divisions, 9 infantry, 2 armoured and 2 airborne. <coughs> and by June, sorry, by July, yeah. uh, once the, uh, the blockage were not as, um, uh, as, as such an imped impediment and were slowing down the advancement, uh, Bradley had to redirect his army. So I'll just show you this map first, just to give you an idea. Okay, so here are the landings. Okay, here are the landings. There's Utah, Omaha, uh, Gold, Sword, uh, uh, Juno, and Sword. Uh, that's, that's the Cottonton Peninsula there. There's Sherbourg up to north. So at this stage, by end of June, early to mid-July, you can see that the US <laughs> First Army was starting to push up and taking that tip of the peninsula. And they're making, now they're making way back down the peninsula. So the aim was to try and get to Avranch as quickly as they could <clears throat> and push the Germans back. Now Paris is over here somewhere and pushed them back. So remember what I said before, this Khan, that was the pivot. The aim of the British was to hold as many German forces there as possible while the Americans swung around back up and then pushed the German army back to Paris. So that, that's the plan. So by June, July, they were starting to work their way down the peninsula, down the peninsula. And remember, this is all blockage country. So it's hard fighting. And casualties were on the rise. Now they had to do, they had, to, they had three main pathways to take. And Bradley chose the, the western road was, the, was uh, along the La Hague de Couton road, which was the firmest road. So if I show you here and back again, it was this road here. You can see here, La Hard de Put, coming down that Couton, just down there. Okay, so that was the preferred way of taking. Remember, this was all blockage area, <coughs> fairly marshy and swampy area up there. It was flat lands. Uh, so they chose to take that particular It didn't mean that they didn't come this way. It just meant that was their preferred uh, route. Okay, just a picture there, German defenders. And that's a picture there of a panther going through the blockage, a hedgerow. You see there the infantry riding along. This is quite common, not only for the Allies, but also for the Germans. Um, so that was, uh, that was something that they developed. Uh, it was very rarely used prior to Normandy, where you had uh, infantry soldiers jumping on the tank to get them there as quickly as possible. And you also notice they weren't taking the road. Um, road networks were constantly ambushed by um, Allied uh, Air Force. 
Uh, you're, sorry, you've got to remember too, uh, the Luftwaffe was virtually non-existent at this time. Uh, Hitler decided to keep a lot of the planes back to <coughs> Syria to defend uh, key installations in Germany. Uh, the Allies had total air superiority at this time, total air superiority, which obviously assisted them in moving forward uh, on, the def on the advance. Okay, Hauser's 7th Army were made up of two corps, the, 11th, the 2nd Parachute Corps and the... Who's good at Roman numerals? A4. 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 A4, thank you so much. 84 Corps. German defence upon three aspects of the battlefield. A short front, formidable terrain, as I said, they used the blockage really well to slow down the Allies. Um, and slow US deployment, uh, so reinforcements, logistics, moving forward. What they didn't count on was air superiority. And if you were to say to me what won the Battle for Normandy, it was air superiority. Simple as that. <coughs> if the Americans didn't have air superiority, I don't believe they would have reached their objectives mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. It would have extended the battle itself and then also meant that uh, Paris would have been liberated much later. It wouldn't have stopped them from winning the war, but I think it would have uh, delayed um, getting out of Normandy. Okay, sorry for a lot of uh, script there. It just gives you an idea. <coughs> Let me just show you the map first and I'll go back. So what you can see here, Cherbourg is taken. They're slowly moving down the Cotterton Peninsula. Okay, um, they got to the point where uh, they're very close to one of their objectives. Okay, one of their objectives was this highway. It was called the Saint Law, Saint Law, Pereira, and Lasse Highway. Bradley believed that if he could get to that point, he can then regroup and push through to the next phase of the campaign. So it's their, one of their objectives for the end of July is to get to that point. But there was some heavy fighting. The Germans weren't giving up. But unfortunately for the Germans, again, air superiority. Um, and also they didn't have a continuous line. So they had pockets of resistance, strong resistance, but they didn't have a full front that they could count on. So it just gives you an idea of the movement. You see that 7th Corps, uh, sorry, 8th Corps took the La Haye de Pieu road. 7th Corps with those divisions, they were to take Couton and Saint Law Highway. The British stayed at Cain, Khan, sorry. They were unsuccessful. Ep Operation Epson was a complete failure. But what it did do, it, it, it meant that the, the, the Germans still believed that Khan was their major objective, so they kept a lot of the strong, the Panzer's divisions there at Khan. Now you can see Eisenhower is quite at the bottom there. I think this sums it up pretty well. Uh, the Germans were not, um, were not giving up. They were holding up tight. And he, he really <coughs> applauded their quality. Uh, but they, the, the Allies still had to cope with the country and the weather. <coughs> okay, so by the end of July, you can see that the Americans first arm were making some significant inroads. And they reached their objective. Okay, the Saint Law Pere Lesse Highway. And that was their next jumping point. They needed to reach that objective which would serve as their next jumping point of the next phase. I'll just move forward. So that's um, St. Law, the uh, capture of St. Law. That was some heavy fighting to take the, this, the town of St. Law. But again, it was vital that they take that. It was a huge uh, road network up. Okay, Operation Cobra. Now we're talking about the 24th of July. So it's late July. You can see that they've made all the way down, halfway down the Cottonton Peninsula, 
at the St. Lowe Pereira Rasse Highway. Blumenson, if you're going to read anything about breakout, Mark Blumenson, who was the official US uh, historian who was there at the time. His book was published in 1960. You can get a PDF and get it off the internet for free. So somehow somebody's put it on the PDF. You don't have to even buy for it. So it's all free access. Uh, it's called Breakout and Pursuit. It was published in 1961. Very detailed, a lot of detail in regards to uh, the Battle of Normandy. And notice Lieutenant General Bradley's comment here, an aggressive action and a readiness to take stiff losses, if necessary, were the key to the success of Cobra. Uh, the two guys who were responsible for Cobra, you see Bradley there with the glasses, and Major General Lawton uh, Collins, who was uh, seventh corps uh, commander. Patton, and this is a bit of a myth, because every time I read anything about Cobra, they always mention General Patton. Patton was not, not involved in Cobra. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about him at the end. Uh, but he had a very, very minor role, if that. So anything you see on YouTube and mentions uh, Cobra and Patton, that is incorrect. Okay, so Patton was not involved. Okay, Cobra depended on uh, another innovative, um, I guess, strategy. And that was aerial bombing. So again, aerial bombing was relatively new as a um, infantry armoured attack. Okay, it was used on, uh, during Operation Goodwood, which happened four days before Cobra. So relatively new. Yes, the British uh, did use it at Goodwood, uh, but it, 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 they, uh, um, it did cause a few uh, issues, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so let me just see if I can find. Well, that's a, that's a B-17. Okay, just quickly go through some of these. That's a B-17. That's a P-47. Okay, so these are probably the, the P-47 with the P-51. But in particular, P-47 proved to be a very um, effective um, uh, uh, aircraft during the Battle of Normandy. And then you had the Hurricane Typhoon, which again, uh, RAF, uh, proved again to be very effective during um, Normandy as well. Okay, this is the, the uh, uh, early stage, uh, a map of the early stages of Cobra. I'll just draw your attention to this area here. Can you see that rectangle? Okay, and you notice there's St. Lowe, which is taken by the Americans, and that's that highway again, the St. Lowe Pereira Lasse Highway, which was the jumping point for Cobra. What Bradley needed was an opening. And he realised that the Germans were not going to give up so easily. So he decided to work with the RAF and the 8th Air Force, the 8th US Air Force, to carpet bomb a small section of the front to allow for that opening to occur. Again, it was, only, it was only done a few days before at Goodwood, Operation Goodwood at, um, with the British. What he learned from Goodwood was that the bombs dropped to support Goodwood were too large and the craters that they created uh, caused uh, probably more of a headache for the British than the Germans did because they had to manoeuvre around these craters and it slowed everything down. So what Bradley said, okay, I don't want 500 pounders being dropped. Give me 50 to 100 pounders only. So he wanted small craters, but a lot of them. So it increased the number of um, bombs dropped and the number of aircraft to come over. He also wanted um, phosphorus, so napalm, which was also dropped on German forces. Okay, so he had high explosives and phosphorus. The area we're talking about was five and a half kilometres long 
and two and a half kilometers wide, deep. So it's a relatively small area. Well, it's big enough to put, put through two divisions. Okay. So that was, that was planned to happen on the 24th, June, July 24th. Uh, Lee Mallory, who was the commander of Air Force for Overlord, uh, stuck his head out the window and realised it was too overcast. By the time he got on the phone to cancel, the planes were already over. Eventually, most of the, some of the pilots did get the message, but others dropped the bombs. They dropped them in the wrong area because they panicked, and it killed, uh, it killed 111 US soldiers from the 30th Division. Okay. Bradley went off his head uh, and rang Lee Marion and said, what's going on? And, and then they, he, told, he heard the story that, uh, that he had to cancel. The other problem that they had was when Bradley spoke to Lee Mallory, he actually went back to London to talk to the RAF and uh, the 8th US. He wanted the bombers to come from this direction to run parallel with the highway. Now, he got the OK, but they changed their mind. So Lee Marley decided, well, that was, that's not going to work. Because if they took that direction, uh, the planes, they'll worry that the planes would be too, uh, uh, too compact, I guess, in a fine formation and be easy targets. So they decided to go back to the original plan, which was to fly over the US Army coming from that direction. And that was one of the causes of the issue because when they dropped the bombs early, they actually dropped them on American soldiers. It's like coming over the American soldiers. However, as you saw in the other quote from Bradley, this was not to stop him. Bradley was pressured by Eisenhower, by Churchill, by Roosevelt to get things moving. They needed to move. So it did not, it did not deter. This uh, accident did not deter Bradley. So they're all back on action on the next day, July the 25th. So at 09.38, the bombers flew again, same formation. They dropped their bombs, and again they missed. We had another 490 uh, uh, wounded, with another 47 killed. Unfortunately, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General McNair, a senior US Army uh, official who was acting as more of an observer at the time, happened to be with one of the front uh, forward units, he died. Uh, so his body was brought back and he was buried uh, and, and, uh, secretly. Uh, so anyway, it was successful, which they thought it was. So now we're talking about July 25th at 11, 1100 hours. Uh, two US infantry divisions stormed through the opening. Okay, the 9th <coughs> and the 30th. Panzer Lear Division, which was it just happened to be there at the time, uh, lost 50% of their men and armaments. So it virtually annihilated the Panzer Lear Division. But being the combat veterans that they were, the 50% that remain still were able to slow the Americans down to a to walking pace. But just to show you the, the uh, determination of the German defences and soldiers. Okay, a lot of, a lot of writing there, so I'll just give you some time to read it. Okay, it got to the point where Major General Collins had to make a significant decision. He had seen that his infantry was slowing down. He's being pressured by Bradley to push, push, push. Now, 
if if it was if it was to follow normal U.S. doctrine, which stated that before he engaged the armored armored divisions, he would need to consolidate the ground. If he had to follow that 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 doctrine, it would have meant another two or three, maybe half, up to four or five days before he could do that, which only meant that the Germans would bring their reinforcements around from the south. So he took the gamble. Collins Gamble. Oh, I should be possibly yes, sorry. He took the gamble. He he committed his armoured brigades before the ground was consult was uh, secured by the infantry, but it paid off because they realised that although the German resistance was stiff, it was not in a continuous line. It was only pockets, and they were able to bypass a lot of the German defences which were eventually mocked up later. Uh, one particular US general that proved to be very effective was Brigadier General Rose of the 2nd Armoured Combat Command, who reached his first objective within the time allocated. He later proved to be a very effective tank commander for the US Army. Uh, Eighth Corps committed itself, it's General Major General Middleton, and was able to commit in the 8th and the 90th divisions. Okay, and you see here the men walking through Qatar, which was one of the major objectives. Now at this stage, everything was going really well. Uh, the Germans started to peel away. Uh, Collins Gamble started to work. Because now you've got six, fourth armoured brigade and sorry, fourth armoured division and sixth armoured division making their way very strongly down the Cottonton Peninsula and making some real inroads into within uh, the German defences. So I'll just show you a map here. This is where they started. That was a jumping off point. Okay, you can see the carpet bombing uh, sector, which was hit by the. Um, by the RAF and 8th Air Force. This was their first objective line. It got to the point where things were going so well, uh, by the 27th, Bradley's decided, okay, we're not stopping. We're gonna keep going. And so he redirected his, um, his uh, field commanders to not to stop, and the final objective was Avrach down at the bottom of the Cotterton Peninsula. <clears throat> and you can see through here the push and um, the impact it had on German, the German defences. This just gives you an idea. And here's a quote from a German uh, NCO, okay, which I think sums it up really well. I had seen the first retreat from Moscow, which was terrible enough, but at least units were still intact. Here we had become a cluster of individuals. And I think that quite really sums up the German state at this point. We're talking about the 27th of July. 27, 28. By the 29th and 30th, 31st, and 31st was the end of Cobra, so they reached their objective was Avarunch. You can see here the impact and the movement of, of the Allied forces, particularly for US First Army. So I'll give you some time to read that. You can also see in, in the third point the Ronsi pocket. So going back to what I said before, a lot of the German resistance were more pockets of resistance as opposed to a continuous line of defences. Now the Ronsu pocket was a fairly significant one, but with air superiority and just this mass of armour coming down the, the peninsula, uh, the Germans really had very little choice but to pull back and withdraw. Okay, and here's a quote there from one of the, uh, one, again from a German officer. Without proper artillery, armour support, the Panzer Grenadiers would not hold. They were not men of the 
Okay, what about pattern? By July 30, 31, Bradley decided to, um, to involve Pat, but to a very minor extent. He was to support Middleton and the Eighth Corps on their way down the peninsula. Okay, so there are reports of him in his Jeep running, driving forward, yelling at the uh, battalion commanders, moving forward, moving forward, and, and asking questions. But he had no uh, field command at this stage. This was going to happen on the August the 1st. So the 1st of August, the US 1st Army would reorganise itself and Patton will take over 3rd Army. Now, 8th Corps was part of 3rd Army. So Middleton became his corps commander. Okay, and this was the taken, taking of Avranch. You see here, there's the tanks moving into Avranch, which is right on the tip of the peninsula, as I showed you before. You see the 4th and 6th Army moving abreast down the peninsula. And 4th uh, Armoured was a very successful brigade or division at the time. That was uh, Brigadier, sorry, Brigade, that was Brigadier uh, Rose's um, uh, unit. Was able to take the bridge at Montaport intact, which allowed them uh, to to uh, begin the next phase, and that was the the um, advance into Brittany around the bottom, and then come back up again. <clears throat> okay, and the final objective: Cobra succeeded with Seventh Corps taking Coton, Eighth Corps taking Granville Avranche. Attrition and manoeuvre had been decisive. <coughs> Why was Operation Cobra successful? So based on my readings and research, these are the five reasons as listed there. Um, the carpet bombing itself and the annihilation as the commander of Panzerleur, General Bayon actually used the word annihilation. The annihilation of Panzerleur had a significant impact on the success of COBRA. Uh, allied superiority, as I said <coughs> earlier. Uh, due to air superiority, not only did you have the impediment of logistics reinforcement, but also communication was, uh, was impacted on as well. The concentrated attack by mechanised force was very important. So we had a small front, we're able to push through and, and push as much um, resources into that front as possible. And the British maintained their pressure at Khan. So you had Operation Goodwood four days before Cobra. While Cobra was, was going on during those months, uh, you had Operation Blue Coat and Operation Atlantic, which again were British operations to keep the Panzer divisions <coughs> intact and remain around Khan, which meant that less Germans were able to be moved over to uh, the western side, yeah, the, the, right, the right flank, if you like, where the Americans were making their way down the peninsula. Okay, aftermath, well, once COBRA was, um, was uh, completed on the July the 31st, on the next day, uh, the US and the Allies were able to reorganize their command structure. And you can see there that a new army group, 12th <coughs> Army Group was created. Uh, Lieutenant General Bradley took over, uh, Hodges, became a US 1st Army commander and US 3rd Army 
became active under Patton. 21st Army Group stayed under Montgomery. Uh, he had 2nd Army Dempsey and a Canadian 1st Army career. career up. Um, interesting enough, Montgomery at this stage was still a full general. He only became Field Marshal on September the 1st. And on that day, sorry, the day before, uh, he lost, because while this was still happening, right up till September, he was Ground Force Commander from the beginning on the 6th of June right up to September. Uh, on that day, the day before, uh, Eisenhower took over as Ground Force Commander. And so Churchill made him a field marshal to compensate the loss. Mm. Mm. That's, that's when he became field marshal of Montgomery. Uh, Hitler attempted a counterattack at Mortain. I'll just show you where that is. Okay, so you look in. Oh, there it is. Okay, so <coughs> Hitler got onto uh, got on the phone and said, um, "No, they need to be stopped. They can't push forward. They cannot they cannot go into Brittany and eventually liberate Paris." Uh, so Kluger decided to uh, was actually ordered. He he didn't think this was a good idea. He actually, uh, but he didn't make that. He didn't articulate that to Hitler. Um, you can see that uh, they invested a number of Panzer divisions into this counterattack, and it failed dismally. Dismally, they lost over 300 tanks. Uh, they wiped out a lot of the uh, resources that they needed uh, later on in their campaign. Uh, it was probably because of this counterattack, which just accelerated uh, the German uh, defeat uh, right up to, um, and you talk about the Falasse fal fal pocket, okay, without a lot of these resources redirected back, um, it meant that uh, the Allies were able to push faster through uh, that the, end, the end of the Battle of North. Okay, that's it. Thank <laughs> you.